I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living. As a world traveler, I'm actually outside of Latin America today. So normally I try to use something either about Nicaragua or Latin America, but I'm actually in Belize as I'm recording this. And I'm trying to record off my laptop because I didn't actually remember to bring all the cables that I needed. So I'm not in exactly the best recording position as I had hoped. And I don't want to use my phone right at the moment because it's charging because I'm about to go out to Belmopan. Hopefully get some cool footage there, so I want to make sure it's ready. So I'm actually recording from the uh, the MacBook Air, and seeing it, I know it's not going to look as good as normal, but I have some really nice light coming in the window, and I want to tell you about my trip here, and I figured this is a great opportunity to do that because I'm waiting to get picked up, and everything is charging, and you don't need the best video of me for me to tell you about my day, so we're going to talk about getting from Nicaragua to Belize City. <laughs> All right, so my journey begins on Saturday. So this whole trip was a last minute thing. Had no time to plan, no time to prepare for anything. I got a call on Thursday night. Hey, we need you in Belize City for a meeting. That happens Monday morning, but that means you have to be here on Sunday. And that means you pretty much got to get moving. There's no time to plan anything. So everything was very rushed and last second. And I didn't have any time because I was doing the live stream. If you haven't seen uh, Thursday night's live stream, it, you can see this happening while I'm on that. And it's very exciting because Belize is a new country for me. Believe it or not, it is the last country in North America that I've never been to. So with this, I now have knocked out every country not including like the Caribbean like on the actual North American continent I have them all but I had to come up on Saturday so I didn't have to leave the house until three o'clock because I did the the flight was in the afternoon so Friday night we went out I did filming hopefully that's going to be a good video uh, but I haven't had a chance to review it yet so I have no idea what the footage looks like uh, but I think we got a good concert video at Via Via on on Thursday night on Friday night uh, last night, so I was tired. So this morning, got up, did all my last minute packing, got everything ready to go. Pretty much was able to relax a bit of the day, but we had some really important meetings going on all day. So I had work stuff going, like even though it's a Saturday, it was a super, super busy day. Uh, and then at three o'clock, my driver, Leo, picked me up. And we drove out to uh, Managua. Now this actually took quite a bit of time. So it was closer to 5.30 when I arrived there. I really wanted to be there at five. My flight is at 7.05 should be there two hours before like let's not be foolish i know people who push it but i'm not that person right i get to airports and i get on my flight uh but it's managua so i wasn't worried even though it's technically international uh i wasn't too worried about that either because the flight is going uh, to el salvador and that is uh it's only semi-international it is another country but it doesn't have full border control, so it tends to be pretty easy. So I got into Managua Airport, went right through security. I was like the only person going through security. It was crazy. Got up to my gate, and it was like, it was like a ghost town. There was two or three people sitting there. Eventually, there was a few more, but it was so few people, and the the whole rest of the airport was empty except the the stalls were open, which was very strange because at night the place gets busy and the stalls are closed. Uh, not not good business planning on some of the the vendor parts. Uh, so I just sat by the gate for a little while. It was very chill. Um, and, and while we were there, I saw, and I've never seen this before, the flight, the Venezuelan flight came in from Havana. And that is a big plane. It's an Airbus A340 with the four engines. Like this is a big uh, intercontinental plane. Uh, and they had so many people disembark from Havana. Really surprised. I thought that was like a really tiny, like twin engine hopper kind of thing. But that is a that is a huge. That must be the biggest flight coming in and out of Managua. I've never seen any that big. So that was really interesting. Uh, our flight for for San Salvador boarded very easily. We had loads of empty space on the plane, as you can imagine, uh, on a on an A320. I'm flying up on Avianca, and that is their hub in the region in San Salvador, so it's, it's very easy logistics. Uh, so we flew up. That's about a 40, 45-minute flight. Super easy. Uh, and it's neat because it flies out of, and I got some footage of this. Uh, so if you watch my shorts, I have a collection of these. But we flew east out of Managua, and so we got really good views of eastern Managua, the airport, Tipitapa, going up the east side of the lake. You can see the road heading up to Matagalpa. And then we flew right over the city, like over the mountains on the south. So we had this great view of the lake and downtown Managua and Ciudad Sandino. And we flew over Nagarote, La Paz Centro, went right over Leon. I could see my house because my house has string lights. And you could actually make them out from the plane. Like, that was pretty crazy. You could, you could see Sutiava. We couldn't see Las Benitas and Ponaloya. They were just, like, under the plane. But really good visibility into Leon. You can make out all the streets and the neighborhoods. That was really cool. And then we flew over the port of Corinto, which was really bright. Corinto and the road going to Chinandega and El Viejo, all that. Very, very obvious. 
uh, only a little bit of cloud cover. It's a low flight. There's never time to get really high. Uh, and then got into uh, San Salvador. Now, San Salvador, this is important for those who've never done this and never thought about it. San Salvador is the main connection airport in Central America. Almost all the other airports in Central America, the majority of them are terminals. They're places you only go to or from. You never pass through them. So Managua, Belize City, places like that. There are some hub airports that have some amount of, you know, international traffic that goes through them, like you would fly in, wait in the airport and fly back out. Panama City is a pre pretty big one for that. Guatemala, a little bit. Uh, San Jose, a little bit. But San Salvador, like Panama City, is designed to be a hub. It is meant for the majority of the traffic to pass through, that you're going to wait in the airport for a layover and then head off somewhere else. So it is all about connections. And when you get into San Salvador Airport, it is really noticeable just how much it's designed for that. It is loaded with shopping and really good restaurants, not like cheap, cheesy chains like you get in American airports, not, not like what you get in Mexico. These are, well, Mexico City is really nice, but like the others, this was really nice, like brew pubs and fancy restaurants and decent prices. And everything was really classy and modern and comfortable and stuff near your gates and well designed. It was it's one of the best airports I have ever experienced. I was so impressed with San Salvador Airport, which is the Avianca hub and a lot of other airlines use it as well. And of course, El Salvador, it is, it is a big destination. It's a big tourist center uh, and a lot of investment is going into stuff like this. But this was I knew it was going to be good. I've heard good things about it. I was really, really impressed. So while I was there, I had about a little over two hour layover and I discovered that there's a brew pub called Cadejo. So I had to go see that. Uh, and it turned out it was directly in front of my gate. So it was absolutely perfect. So I went to the Cadejo Brewing Company, uh, sat at the bar, got a couple beers, quite good. Um, I got the, the Hija de Pooh, which is the daughter of Winnie the Pooh. So it's a honey, um, honey, lager, I think. And there I got a stout and I got some shrimp tacos that were delicious. So it was really good. I managed to get a good meal. I had a nice beer and a place to sit and relax and then headed to my gate uh, and was able to go right on right through into the, the waiting area basically to load. So the timing was perfect. I do want to point out the security heading to Guatemala was um, short of Ataturk in Istanbul, the most extreme I've ever seen. They, we had already gone through security, right? We'd, we were already doing the normal security checkpoints. Then just to get into your gate, the gate itself was walled off. You had to go through another checkpoint where they took every single person's luggage. They did every person got a pat down. Every person had their luggage opened. This is your, your carry-on luggage. And they actually go through it and look through it as opposed to going through a scanner. So it was a, a completely different and additional step for security. So that was interesting and something to know that it can be a couple minute delay in getting to your gate. So be aware you want to allow a few more minutes if you're if you're doing that. I don't know how often that happens or what's going on. Then I uh, was able to board pretty quickly. All my flights on Avianca today, I'm in one of the first rows. I'm in the first boarding group. Uh, so that was really nice. I was able to get in. Everything's super comfortable and uh, got on our flight to Guatemala, which went really well. It was a quick, it's like 40 minutes, uh, nice, comfortable flight up to Guatemala City, which is my favorite city like ever. <laughs> so I got up there, got to Aurora Airport, and there I had to go through customs in Guatemala. That took a little bit, but no problems, just a unit paperwork, standing in line, that kind of stuff. Uh, got my luggage and was into Guatemala City. Once I got through customs and immigration and into Guatemala, then, and by the way, I want to mention this, there's, I had absolutely no information during my entire flight or my check-ins, my bookings, anything, that said, I needed to go fill out an immigration form for Guatemala. Most places, they just hand you a paper or they tell you as you do things. This never came up. I have no idea how I didn't get this because I was the only one on the flight who was not aware of this. But they all had this information prior to getting on the plane. Maybe I'm the only one who didn't book my own flight. And maybe someone else was given the information they didn't pass it on to me. But everyone's like, yeah, you scan this thing and you put in your information, they give you a code. What? I have no idea about this, and they have no other process. So if you if you don't have that, you get up to the customs line, and they're like, oh, we have to find someone with the code. You scan a QR code, and then you have to fill it out on your phone right there. I don't, I'm, they were very polite. I'm sure they would have helped you. But if you don't have data, so if you're not on T-Mobile or something like that, like if you're a Canadian who can't have international phone service and you weren't told about this ahead of time, you don't have it saved on your phone, I have no idea what you would do. I'm sure they would accommodate you. But I just, like, it was not meant for that at all. Uh, so when I got there, 
Um, I didn't have it, so I scanned it. I typed it all in. It was super slow because you're in like it's in like a secure area. Uh, but then it just generates a little QR code on your phone. Take a picture of it and then show it to them. You walk right through. So it's it's a great system if you know about it. Who knows why I didn't get that? But anyway, so I got through the airport uh, and, and was out into the the city. My plan was just get an Uber. So does Guatemala City have Uber? Yes, has Uber works great. Right, it's fully supported, fully legal. It's not like in San Jose or Cancun where like, yes, it exists, but there's like, you know, problems with it because the, the city doesn't support it and there's crime against it. It's not like that. Guatemala City, very, very logical, effective place with, with really good transportation. So just use Uber and don't be me and discover when you get out of the airport that for some reason you don't have Uber on your phone. I had Lyft, I had Uber Eats, but I didn't have Uber. So I'm like, oh, oh, crap. So I start downloading it, right? Because you don't take taxis. Taxis are expensive and dangerous. So I'm not going to get in a taxi unless it's an absolute emergency. So I started downloading Uber and I went outside and I was waiting for it. And it was cool because I got outside of the airport. Uh, if you're a regular of my channel, you know, two years ago, just under, uh, I went to uh, Guatemala City with Yvonne and Valentina and we hung out. Uh, and I went, I walked to Aurora Airport and got Valentina. This is where she flew in. I came in by bus, so I've never flown through Aurora before. Uh, but Valentina uh, flew in there, and it was after years of working together. This is the first time we met in person. So she came out of the airport. I had walked to the airport to meet her, and we met right in front of the airport. And as I came out of the airport, and I'm standing there, I looked around and realized I was standing right where Valentina and I had met on the show two years ago. I was like, oh, this is so cool. Immediately, I knew exactly where I was. I knew how to get around the city. Um, and it was like this really cool, like, this is where Valentina and I did this really long walk through the city starting from right here. So it was really cool. And I'm standing there, I'm looking at my phone, and Uber's going to take forever to download. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I could be here 30 minutes and an hour for it to download. The, the data is so slow. I've got internet. Like, everything's working. It's just really slow. I'm like, you know what? I... I just need to get into my hotel. I've got an early flight tomorrow. I do, I do not have time to deal with this. So I just grabbed my luggage and started walking. Uh, Google is like, it's only a 40 minute walk to your, to your hotel. I'm like, good enough. So I hiked the same walk that I did twice two years ago. So I knew the area, like that made it really comfortable, right? I knew I couldn't get really lost. I knew at worst case, I was just gonna have to wait for Uber somewhere else. At least I'd be closer. So I'm walking on the way. And I know like once you're out of the air, so first of all, the airport, the zoo, all this stuff is like along this, this way. And then you go under the aqueduct and then you're on this ring road and it's loaded with restaurants, Denny's, Burger King, um, Pizza Hut, like places you could really go and have a, a landmark and just sit and wait. So I was like, I really feel comfortable doing this walk. So I was carrying my luggage, a backpack on my back, phone in my pocket, uh, luggage in my hand. I couldn't roll it because it's just, that would be the end of it. And so I'm carrying it the whole way, doing like a lopsided farmer's carry. And uh, went and just did the 40 minute walk to the Hilton Garden Inn, uh, got in. It was a little bit sweaty at that point, but you know, I got some exercise out of it and I only, had I had Uber ready, yeah, I'd have saved 30 minutes. But if I didn't, not having Uber ready, by the time I was in the hotel, it still hadn't downloaded. So I would have wasted valuable time to exercise and waited who knows how much longer for Uber to download. It didn't download within the next hour after I was in the hotel. And um, I would have given up a lot of important sleep time. So I'm really glad I did the walk. Like that was absolutely the right decision. I know it sounds like that was kind of reckless and stupid, Scott. Not having Uber was stupid, but Doing the walk, given the situation, was absolutely the right thing to do. So got in, really nice room at the Hilton Garden Inn. I always liked the Garden Inn um, and uh, showered. I had to do a little bit of paperwork for work and uh, got that all done. Got some uploads working, just just got a few maintenance items done that I, that I wanted to do, set up the laptop and stuff. I was super quick night, right? Didn't like do, because my uh, by this point, it's after 11 that I'm in the hotel. And I luckily, I had decided to eat in El Salvador, so I wouldn't have to deal with food in Guatemala, because that's like my only meal for the day. Uh, and by the time I got into uh, Guatemala, like I had not visited a bathroom yet since I left Leon at before three o'clock. I had not had water yet. I'd had the two beers, but that was it. I hadn't had any access to water or anything of the sort. So I was like, this has been a day. I just want to get some water. I want to get a little bit, I want to get a shower. I want to get in bed because I got to get up at six o'clock in the morning to head to La Aurora again, not walking. I'll take an Uber um, and get on my morning flight. And my morning flight was with Tropic Air. And like the ticket on my phone does not give me a lot of confidence and there's not a lot of information. Like it's all very 
confusing and I and Aurora is not the most organized airport to begin with so I'm like okay I really want everything to be just I want ducks in a row I want lots of time at the airport because something's going to go wrong so went to bed as quickly as I could and managed to get about four hours of sleep by the time I had to be up and shower and get dressed and head to the airport called an uber in the morning that took two minutes to come get me and maybe five minutes to go to the airport so very fast perfect very cheap uh, dropped me right off the airport. I was able to go right in. But this is where it started to get a little bit confusing. So getting into the airport, Tropic Air has no place to check in. That's the first thing. There's no signs of Tropic Air anywhere. So that can be a problem if you're, if you're like, I'm flying Tropic Air. What do you do? You have no one to talk to. Now, I know from the ticket, it says operated by TAG, which is the Guatemalan National Airlines, the flag carrier. So I'm like, okay, I can probably talk to TAG. But my thing said I had a ticket. You have nothing to do. It says you're completely ready. This is your ticket, right? Like, I do this all the time. I fly all different countries, all different types of tickets. I did this yesterday with Avianca, exact same thing. I go into the airport. I have a photo of my, the, when it says this is your ticket and it sends you all that, this is your boarding pass. You have a picture of it. You're done. I don't have to, like, I'm not doing a bag drop because I'm not checking any luggage. So I go in and I'm like, you know, I'm good. I'm all done. I've got my ticket. I got to go to the plane. I get to security. They're like, nope, this isn't a valid ticket. I'm like, this is the ticket. This is your ticket. You're all set, right? Like, it's super crystal clear that this is supposed to be your boarding pass and, and all the information's on it in a really weird format. And they're like, nope, you got to go upstairs and check in. I'm like, oh boy. So I went upstairs and I'm like, who do I talk to? All right, so I went upstairs and I went to TAG. As soon as I went through TAG, they're like, oh, where are you going? And, blah, blah, blah. and then once I said Belize, Belize in Guatemala, they're like, oh, right? Like, they're like, oh, of course you're confused. So immediately they're like, okay, we have to give you a boarding pass and stuff. So I have to get a TAG boarding pass and ticket. Like, okay, well, that should not be called your ticket if it's not your ticket. Like, it's your receipt to get the ticket that you must do at a place that they haven't been crystal clear you have to go to. Yeah, it's hidden in there, but it was not clear. So this, you really got to know this. If you were like a first-time flyer, this would have been a disaster. I fly all the time, so I was pretty confident we were going to figure this out. And it's a small airport, so, you know, you've got some flexibility. But I know on my return flight that they close check-in hours before the flight. Hours. And if you don't make, uh, so I have an 1140 flight, I think, on Tuesday. If you haven't checked in by 940, you don't get on the plane. And it says that in some like really tiny stuff that doesn't make any sense because you already have a ticket. So if that was my first flight, I would never have guessed I needed to check in. Yeah, okay, check-in closes. Who cares? I don't need to check in. I got my ticket. But that is not the case. You do have to check in. So that was like, oh, no, this is a big problem. So I was really worried that they weren't going to be open. But I, they were. And, but I got a couple surprises. One is they had to print a boarding pass. So I got a completely different ticket than the one I had. Uh, I did not get a digital one, but that's okay. And uh, they, they took my carry-on luggage. They're like, no, there's no carry-on on this flight. It's hundred percent checked. None of this information existed anywhere, right? So I had no idea I needed to check luggage. Um, I was ready for that by coincidence, but it was a total surprise. So I gave them the luggage, they took care of that. And then I walked down, went right through security, zero problems there, um, went to my gate. Now this gets interesting. I go to the gate and it's at gate 14. So I had to walk all over the airport to find this hidden like gate behind things. It's past the Copa lounge. It's in like a court, like you're so like, this is not even a real gate. And it has stairs going places because it's everything else. You go down a gangplank. This one is not designed for that. This one's designed for walking on the tarmac. And you're like, oh, uh, uh. so I get there. I'm the only person there, like the only one. I'm worried that I'm so late that they might have left me behind because not at by the time I got to the gate, but going through the check-in because you had to be there four hours before in, in Belize to be allowed to get on your plane. So being only two hours before, which is what I was at this point, it was like, why is this a ghost town? People must, somebody must know that you have to be four hours ahead. Crazy. So I got in and it was absolutely empty. It was a ghost town. I was the only person. They didn't even have a TV. They have nothing that even signals it's an operating gate, except that as you get close to it, there's something that says gate 14. But once you're in it, it doesn't say anything. So I'm in there and I'm like, I keep going to the board saying it doesn't change. My paper says gate 14. The board says gate 14. But there's nothing to indicate this will ever be an operating gate. Eventually, after like an hour, uh, a couple 
um, came, uh, Mark and Kathy came and, and they were like in the same boat as me an hour later. And I'm like, yeah, this is gate 14 and this is where everything says to go. And yes, it's confusing and no, we're the only ones here. And they're like, okay. So we talked for a little while, got to know them and talk to them about Nicaragua. They're thinking about adding it to their itinerary now. They were heading to Belize to relax after doing some backpacking. And uh, then they're like, we're going to get some coffee. And I'm like, okay, it's a good idea. So I went and found a coffee place and grabbed a, a croissant uh, and came back. We ended up having somewhere between 10 and 12 people at the gate by the time the flight actually went. But it was, it was even then, it was like, okay, I'm feeling good. There are six of us here now at one point. And at that point, I'm like, I think think we're okay but this is kind of crazy how few people are here um, and then uh and then they boarded without saying anything so the like some people were behind me they went and got in onto the plane area and i turn around and i'm like people have disappeared like they weren't going to call anyone you just had to walk onto the plane this was so disorganized i've never seen anything of the sort and so we ran in we were the last ones in we've been there for hours and then they loaded the plane without telling us and uh then got a tiny little plane it is a dual prop I was led to believe by Tropic Air that they only operated Cessnas. This was a larger, I think it was a Beechcraft. It was a dual engine. Um, it probably could seat 24 people or so. And we had between 10 and 12. It was seriously empty. Uh, and I was in uh, row 3A, which is the, the, so there's one row of seats on one side and two rows on the other. So it's three wide, very, very small. So I was, I was on the one side, one row back. But the girl who was in the one in front of me moved to the other side because it's completely empty and she wanted two seats to herself. And I'm like, oh, actually, I'd like to sit kind of kitty corner in the front one. So I moved. So I was in A1, uh, flew in that. And uh, honestly, it was a it was a very comfortable ride out to out to Belize City. Took, I think, about an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 15 minutes because uh, it's a much slower flight. But, um, you know, some people don't like flying in, in props. I found it very comfortable. The whole thing was good. Uh, it was a, it was a real tag plane. It wasn't like a Tropic Air little plane. This is a full kind of tag airplane, um, and uh, and that went really well. And so got into Belize uh, at about eleven o'clock in the morning. Landed, uh, no problems at all in Belize. Belize airport is so tiny. This is definitely a terminal airport. Uh, land on the tarmac. You just come out and they gather everyone at the at the bottom of the stairs. Which, by the way, only one person can be on the stairs at a time on these. It can't support two people. And uh, so they had to wait. Every person, they're like, wait, wait, wait. Person gets off. The okay, next person. It was so weird. And then we're standing on the tarmac. And then once we're all off the plane, some guy's like, mm, okay, everyone with me. And then we walk together. And he just looks for an open door and then lets us into the place. And then we go through the really small immigration line. You do have to fill out a paper for that, but that's obvious they hand it to you. Uh, and and uh, go through customs. Nothing to declare. It was very easy. Uh, and uh, luckily, I was, you know, I always worry when I'm coming into a country, oh, I'm here for work. Should I really say that? Should I just say I'm vacationing? They're never going to ask anything. But I'm like, yeah, I'm here for work. And they're like, you know, oh, what kind of work do you do? And when I say what I, who I'm meeting with, they're just like, okay, have a good time. <laughs> like, no questions at all. So very easy. Got in, and I had a driver waiting for me. So I was able to walk out, and he just had the sign. And I'm like, yes. And he just drove me to my hotel, where I am here in Buttonwood Bay in Belize City. So I'm here in the main city. For those who don't know, the majority of the population of the entire country is here in Belize City, which is on the water, and it's on a peninsula. So there's water all the way around. There's water everywhere. Uh, so it's neat. And here in Buttonwood, we're on uh, kind of the north side. Um, so we have we have beautiful Caribbean views. We can see the Keys. Uh, lots of restaurants. Super safe area. Lots of really nice places. Airbnb, uh, not Airbnb, bed and breakfast and small hotels. Um, and nice housing. This is this is pretty nice uh, out here on the Caribbean. Uh, the south side of the city is a lot rougher. That's where a lot of the crime is. Uh, and then the capital is at Belmopan because I'm told because there were so many hurricanes here, the government got tired of constantly having to rebuild. So they moved the capital in about 1985. I remember as a kid, this was like news that Belize was moving its capital inland a lot like Brazil had done. And it's like, what a weird thing. I it was like I remember this like standing out in the news like this artificial city that they built just for the government uh, and that people didn't really want to live there because it was so far from the water. Uh, but it's about 30,000 people live in Belmopan and it's their secondary city now. Um, and that's where I'm actually going to be working on Monday morning. So on Monday at around 830 or so, I'm getting picked up and we're driving out to Belmopan, which is a little under an hour 
uh, and we're going to get to see that. So most tourists never see Belmopan. They never see the capital because it's there's just really very little reason to go there. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting to see that and Belize City. We might go and do some extra stuff as well. I have no idea how much time there's going to be, but um, I think that'll be cool to get to see that at least. So this is a very different trip. This is in nothing in any way a tourist trip. This is completely business. And, uh, and I've done work with uh, Belize for about two years, so it is really time for me to be here for sure. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting what I get to see while I'm here. I'm hoping that I do get plenty of time to film. It's, I'm such a quick turnaround. It's going to be tough to get too much of anything, but I'm going to do my best uh, to get footage um, and whatnot for you guys uh, on this trip. Once I arrived in Belize, came out here to my hotel, uh, which is in Buttonwood Bay. So the taxi driver brought me out here. This is a bed and breakfast. They have like six rooms. I actually have a private cabin, which is fantastic. Really, really nice. And uh, so I came out here. I'm gonna show just a little bit around so you guys can see where I am. This is a beautiful little spot. Highly recommended if you're coming out to Belize City. Let me spin around, show you. Just a very cute little place. And we're gonna head out to the road here into Belize City, but I'm just one block off of the water. Ooh, look at that sun bright in our faces. And I'm gonna be heading out to record, 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 record tomorrow's episode right now. This is the first chance that I've had to get outside and go really walking and do anything outside because I've been very busy. It's a, very, it's a work trip, I've got a lot to do, but Wanted to show you my day. So we got in here uh, and then uh, after, you know, getting, a, I don't know, an hour or so to relax in the hotel, went out, had lunch, and then uh, went to a business partner's house uh, and spent the evening hanging out with him and his family. Went out to, uh, to dinner, really nice fancy restaurant, had a nice evening, uh, and then spent the evening after that in the hotel. So that was my start of my trip to Belize. I'm heading out to the water and hopefully you'll be able to see a bit of at least the waterfront. We're not gonna be able to show you a ton. I'm not gonna be able to take you a bunch of different places. We're gonna have some stuff to show you. I've got water right in front of me. I'm gonna change hands here so you get some more light on me uh, in tomorrow's episode. So thanks for joining me. Uh, I know this is kind of a boring, like just my story of how I got out here, but that's, uh, I've got a lot of travel going on this week. Uh, so it's what I've got to work with, uh, but like and subscribe if you would like to support the channel. Ooh, gets windy out here on the water. Uh, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, share on social media, tell someone about the show. And uh, let me just, uh, from beautiful Caribbean waterfront, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And we'll do my best to pop up some videos on the screen. I probably will miss it. Uh, but if you want to click on one of those or go on and click on one of my other episodes, tells the algorithm that you like the show.